I often wonder why the truth is not popular. But from our, uh, our lesson this morning, it said that the desire for an easy religion that requires no striving, no self-denial, no divorce from the follies of the world has made the doctrine of faith and faith only a popular doctrine. Faith requires us to grow. And because growth is the part of is is a lot is part of faith, then growth produces things. And if something isn't growing, it's dead. And so the Bible teaches us that faith without works is dead. And so that faith requires striving, self-denial, and a divorce from worldly follies. And this is what makes truth uh, unpopular. And so today I want to uh, share a message that will um, cause us to examine ourselves whether we be in the faith. And so you can turn your Bibles to, uh, to our scripture reading which is in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. And the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates. So here the, the words of Scripture are calling upon us to examine not the person next to us, not the people down the road, not the people in the other churches. Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Know your own selves. Is Jesus Christ in you or not? That's the question you need to ask yourselves. Do I have Christ living in me? Examine that. Scrutinize yourself. Is it Christ or is it something else that is in me? Because if Christ is not in me, then I am a reprobate. Reprobate is just morally depraved. Morally depraved, unprincipled Wicked person. And unfortunately, that's how we are without Christ. We are all, doesn't matter where we were born, what class of society we are in, how people think of us, if we do not have Christ in us, then we are morally depraved, unprincipled, wicked people. Now the question is, how do I know if Christ is in me? How do I know this? Or a better question is, what does it mean to have Christ in me? Well, firstly, we need to establish who is Christ. What makes Christ, Christ? Is it His arms and His legs? Is that what makes Him Christ? His character, His person, His mind. That's what makes somebody, somebody. The character, the mind. So the question really is, do I have Christ's mind in me? Do, does my mind function in the same way Christ's mind functioned? That is the question. So Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 shows us that this is exactly where we need to examine ourselves. In Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, and it states here, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's what it means to have Christ in you, to have His way of thinking, to have His view on life. 
Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I need to examine myself. Am I in the faith? What does that mean? Do I have Christ's mind? Do I see things the way he see thing, sees things? Do I, do I do things the way he does things? Am I in the faith? Now, what would happen if I had a little bit of the mind of Christ and a little bit of the mind of self? What would that produce? Would that be called double-minded? Double-minded. And the Bible says that a man can be double-minded. And in James chapter 1 and verse 8, it says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So there is more stability in having a a mind that is just set on self and on the world and just happy with that. There is more stability in such a life than having a mind, having a bit of the mind of Christ and having the mind of the world and trying to satisfy both concepts, to try and satisfy both mentalities. We become unstable. And so James, the Apostle James, calls upon us in James chapter 4 and verse 4, calls upon us to cleanse our double-minded ways. And as he, before He calls upon us to do this, He makes this statement in James chapter 4 and verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And then it says, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But He giveth more grace, wherefore He saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and, purif and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. This is the message to Christians. If you call yourself a Christian, then this message is for you. Do not be double-minded. If we are double-minded, we are committing adultery. And can any person that continues to commit adultery enter into the kingdom of heaven? No, this is a sin that must be forsaken, repented of and forsaken. And so, if we have friendship with the world, then we are double-minded. So we might have a Christian mindset to a certain degree and yet still have a fondness to worldly activities. And while ever that fondness of these worldly activities is there, I am double-minded and when I'm double-minded, I'm not in the faith. And I have to examine myself, where am I fond of the world? And so Philippians chapter 2, if we turn back to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, and we see in verse 5 we read that let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That was verse 5. Now we're going to read on. In Philippians chapter 2, it says, Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation... And took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became ob obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Even 
the death of the cross. Let this mind be in you. How far do you want to serve God? Do you want to serve Him and be a servant for the Lord unto death? Even the death of the cross? Because not all deaths are of equal magnitude. Now you could be shot in the forehead at point blank range and it wouldn't be that big a deal because you wouldn't know anything after that bullet entered your brain. But how about the cross? Is that, is that on the same level as being shot in the head? Oh, this is suffering. Great suffering, conscious suffering. Are you willing to be obedient un- to the point of major conscious suffering to be obedient to Christ? Are we in the faith? Are we in the faith? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 38, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 38. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. If we do not take up our cross, which was the symbol of Christ's death, if we do not take that up and follow him in that path, we are not worthy to be called Christians. If the world will do better if such people who do not want to go down that path at all would remove their name from Christianity. Philippians chapter 2 tells us, let this mind be in us. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Is Christ in you or not? Because if he's not, you're reprobate. You're not in the faith. And so we think, okay, Christ didn't make himself of any reputation. But I want to read the text before this in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2 that we read. We want to examine ourselves. Philippians 2 and verse 5, let this mind be in you. What mind is that? The mind of Christ. Read in verse 2, it says, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. And then in verse 3, what does it say? Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look, not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What sort of mind? Let nothing be done. Nothing. Now, do you think that Christianity should penetrate every particular of our life? What if no one's watching? What if we're in our home life when when the people around us can't see? Should Christianity, should the mind of Christ penetrate that area of my life? So this nothing, let nothing be done, that means nothing at all be done through strife or vainglory. And you know when I think of vainglory, do you know what I think about? I think about sport. I think it's probably the most vainest thing in the world to be so fanatical about kicking a piece of leather through some poles, being so entrenched in some game of some sport and the reward that people get, the pay that people get for running around chasing a piece of leather. I mean, how would your life be at the end of the life you would have thought, well... What have I accomplished? I've accomplished that I have thrown the most balls in a basket. That's my accomplishment in my life. I mean, what's that going to achieve at the end? I mean, is that going to make the grave any sweeter? Is it going to open the portals of heaven to you? That you have achieved so well in some sport? If we ponder the vainness of sport... 
and how much the world actually consider it glory. We would do well to consider that if we want to be in the faith, that we really can't partake in vain glory. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Baseball, you hit the ball and you run around in a circle and everyone claps. What does it achieve? Does it make the world a better place? Does it help the homeless? Does it feed the poor? Not at all. So our consideration is in regards to sport and Christianity. Should Christians involve themselves in sport? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter, two, chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we read a text that equates the spiritual walk with a sporting activity. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24. Now I know that these, this message is not a popular message. So if you're upset, that is no surprise because if we want to be in the faith... There are certain things that we need to get rid of. We need to divorce ourselves from the follies of this world. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain, and every man that striveth for the master is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So here now it's just talking and, and the apostle is, is showing the fanaticism that is in sports in his day. Now, we, we often think that our oh, sports is more of a recent thing, that Christ didn't live in a time where there was sports, so he wasn't so tempted with sports. But do you know that's false? Do you know that the Greeks ruled the world and in ruling the world they decided to not just conquer by rulership but they wanted to spread the culture of Greece to all the world and so one thing they invented was a set of games called the Olympic Games and that was established before Christ came into the world. Now we have no record that Christ went to the Olympic Games nor do we have any record that Christ watched the Olympic Games and so we need to follow him in that that we don't need to be involved in such Greek paganism. And that's exactly what it is, Greek paganism. And so Paul, knowing the fanaticism of the Greeks and the, the culture that it spread through, and, and in fact history do, does tell us that in Judea there were gymnasiums for sport to be exercised by the Jews. Even the rabbis engaged in a certain level of sport. So Paul takes, takes advantage of this uh, fanaticism and he says, well, you know, you're, they're so fanatical in regards to their sport that they train, they're temperate, they don't want to indulge in anything because they want to be fit and they want to win, win the race. Now Paul says that's, that's, uh, they do that for, an, uh, for a corruptible crown, but what about Christians? How fanatical are you about Christ? Now, fanatical is a, a word that is a, it has a negative term in today's society. But do you know that the word fan is just the shortened version of fanaticism or a fanatic? You shorten that and that's where you get the word fan from. So who's a fan of a sport team? Well, if you're a fan of a sport team, you're a fanatic. That's, that's English. If you're a, a fan of a certain person, you're a fanatic. And... It's not an uncommon thing for, for me to be called a fanatic. And that's exactly what I am. I'm a fanatic. Do you know who I'm a fan of? Jesus Christ. I am a fan of Jesus Christ. And I'm not ashamed of that one bit. So if anyone wants to call me a fanatic, or anyone wants to call anyone who is a fan of Jesus a fanatic, take that as a compliment. But we can't get away from the fact that the world is definitely fanatical about sport. That's a blazing fact. And so Paul picks up on the fanaticism 
of them and how particular they are with their health and with their, with their training. And he says, if you apply that energy, that enthusiasm into the spiritual walk, you'll do well. And he says, but don't you know that the people who do that, only one person wins the prize. Is that the case in the spiritual walk? Not at all, because we all can win the prize equal. Now, this is the thing about sport in that for one to win the prize, that requires lots of people not to win. And so the glory that is involved in sport is the glory not just in that the fact that the person won, but they glory that the others didn't. And so there is taking advantage of other people's failures. Now this causes strife. Have you ever seen in a sports game that after one team loses that there's some violence displayed? Does that happen in sport? Okay, so strife is involved. So there is vainglory and there is strife. And the scripture says, let this mind be in you. If you're going to be a Christian, if you want Christ to be in you, examine yourselves with you in the faith. Because if you do anything through strife or vainglory, then we must come to the conclusion that Christ's mind is not in me. And if Christ is not in me, then I am a reprobate, even if I claim to be in the faith. And this is quite challenging, quite challenging concept, that one person wins the prize at the expense of everybody else. Now, <clears throat> when I was young, I was involved in a race, and I tell everyone that I came forth in this race, but there was only four people in the race. So really there's no glory in that because essentially I came last. So if you were the first, if you ran a race and you were first, but the truth was that you were the only person in the race, is there any glory in that? Not at all. You actually need people to lose for you to get glory. If you run a race and there's a million people and you came first, how much glory would you have? The more the people lose, the greater glory you'll gain. Now, this, this fundamental principle of, of, of mental activity is as far from Christ as Satan himself. And if we consider what the Bible says in regards to uh, how we need to treat people that, that lose, or, or, or uh, um, let's just turn there and read it in Proverbs, Proverbs 24... Proverbs 24 and verse 17. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 17. And the Bible says, Rejoice not when thy enemy falleth, and let not thy heart be glad when he stumbleth. Now, could you apply this to sport? You couldn't play sport if you applied this. You could never be happy winning if you applied this. Because for you to win requires someone else to make some failures. So the Bible says rejoice not. Now when we talk about enemy, we think, well, when I play sport, the other person isn't really my enemy. Well, do you know, they actually are when it comes to the end goal. They are your enemy. Now, they might not be your enemy in every aspect of life, but when it comes to what you're trying to achieve, they are the opposing force. And so if you were playing um, rugby or some uh, football sport and you were, you were running with the ball and, and your, your, your opposing force was about to catch you and tack you to the ground, but they tripped over, would that make you smile? Would you be a little gleeful at the fact that they fell over and you could go through and do a touchdown or score or whatever the game you're playing, would you be slightly happy about that? Would, would you be just... Well, right there we break exactly what the Bible says. Right there. If, if we just are glad when he stumbleth, we don't have the mind of Christ. Now, Christ is not glad when His creatures sin and fall over. Christ doesn't rejoice in heaven every time you sin. And while we were yet enemies, 
we were the enemies of Christ. The world is the enemies of Christ. But does Christ laugh and, and, and uh, is joyful when his creatures fall into sin? Not at all. He is so, so sad. In fact, the, the testimonies say that there is weeping in heaven. Now that is such a far cry from being on a, a, in a big football stadium and, and you can imagine that the, the team who is, who is winning all start crying because the, enemy, uh, the, the opposing team fell over. Does that happen? Not at all. And so as Christians, we might not actually even be playing the sport, we might, we might be sitting down watching it. And we might, have, we might be a fan of a certain team and that's generally when you're a fan of a team you want to see them play. You're very interested in that team. And although you're not in the game itself, you're still happy when the other team fail. There's a big sense of relief. Whew, they're winning. Great. So whether you play sport or whether you even watch sport, we are going directly against the words of Scripture. Now I want to remind you something about the mind of Christ. Someone's mind is made up of words. Essentially, that if we boil everything down to, we're just some words. In our heads, the thoughts that go around us, those thoughts, aren't thoughts words? Yeah, that's all they are. Thoughts are words. And those, those words that float around us, who we are, they create feelings, don't they? Thoughts create feelings. And then those feelings create actions and words and they create habits who make us who we are so when we boil it right down to we are just thoughts and words and so we can understand that when Jesus Christ is identified in the Bible as the word of God that's exactly who he is so when we disobey what scripture is saying when we do rejoice when our enemy falls or the opposing force falls and when we are glad when they stumble we are directly opposed to the words of Christ and if we are opposed to the words of Christ are we not opposed to the mind of Christ and if we are opposed to the mind of Christ are we in the faith so our, our, our consideration is examine examine yourself within your faith are you in the faith how are you when it comes to sport? Malachi chapter 7 and verse 8 tells us of, of the enemy, talking of the devil in Malachi. <clears throat> Malachi chapter 7 and verse 8. Malachi chapter 7 and verse 8. Sorry, it's actually Micah. Micah, sorry, I wrote that one down wrong. My apologies. Micah, actually, I didn't, read it. I didn't write it down wrong. I read it wrong. Micah 7 and verse 8. Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Who is the one that rejoices when the opposing force fall? Who? The devil. The devil is happy when you fall. Is God happy when you fall? No. So if I am happy at the failings of another team in sports, whose mind do I have? The devil's mind. And if I have the devil's mind, can I go to heaven? That'd be absurd. I mean, the devil was kicked out of heaven. And do you think that we could become the devil and then go back into heaven? Not at all. And so these elements of, of, um, of com competitive sports is biblically from the flesh. Read with me in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. In verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. How does the flesh manifest itself? Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Idolatry. We're going to find out later that 
Sport is none, nothing short of idolatry. Witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions and heresies. This word emulations, if you don't know what it means, please look it up in your dictionary. Emulations is the principle of sport, where you compete with someone else and you emulate what they do, you copy them to the, in, to the point of beating them, being better than them. So emulation from the Bible comes from where? It comes from the flesh. Now the interesting thing about this emulation, it says in verse 21, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings and such like, and we're concentrating here on emulations, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you need it any clearer? That if you involve yourself in emulations, in competitive sports, in, in watching and engaging in competitive sports, if you do that and there is no repentance and turning from such wicked ways, then don't, uh, don't be deceived, but you will not be going to heaven. Now, I didn't make that up. That's what it says. That's what the Bible says. And because I'm a fan of Jesus Christ, what he says I take very seriously. If we do these things, we shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, notice... In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 7, what the Bible says in regards to this, again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 7, it says, Neither be idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. What did the Bible call these? This is the, the Israelites. In fact, this is a quote. Do you know where it comes from? It comes from Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. This quote comes word to word from Exodus chapter 32. What happened in Exodus chapter 32? There was the golden calf. Now, what's involved with sport? If you win, what do you get? Well, you might not get a cow, but you might get a golden basketball or something that is called a trophy. And how much do people love the trophy? I mean, that's the prize. You, you, you rise up to play, and then at the end of the playing, you come out with a golden statue. And how much do you appreciate that golden statue? I remember when I was... Um, a teenager and I played on the basketball team and we got a trophy, we won the grand final and it was my first trophy ever. And I got this trophy and I was very fond of it. But you know what happened the same day? Someone sat on it and snapped it in half. Someone snapped my trophy and I was very upset. But in hindsight, that was probably the biggest blessing that ever happened to me, that my trophy got broke the day I got it. Because these trophies that, that we get in the world are a symbol to us of our efforts and our glory and our accomplishments. And that's what the golden calf was. Let's turn there to Exodus 32 and verse 6. Exodus 32 and verse 6. And we're considering, are we in the faith? As, the, as people of God, as professed people of God, are we really in the faith? Let's not fool ourselves. Exodus 32 and verse 6. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go ye down, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. 
They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed unto it and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and I may consume them and I'll make of thee a great nation. And we understand that Moses pled on their behalf. But how many people died because of this? Thousands of people died because of this activity. They came out of Egypt. They're now followers of Jesus Christ. They're followers of the Lord. And then they get killed because of their playing activity with the result of a golden calf. Now, do you know worship, when we think worship, we don't really worship golden calves. We don't sit there and rub our nose on the floor and and pay homage to statues of gold and things like that. But do you know the word worship doesn't mean that? The word worship simply means admiration, to admire. Just to admire. So the question is, when the consequences of sport are achieved and the goal is is received, the the trophy is made, do you admire that at all? If you admire that, then you're worshipping it. Let's just be serious. Let's just have common sense about the subject. If you admire it, you worship it. And and so this uh, idolatry is against the Ten Commandments. But it's not just about breaking the commandment about idolatry, but even when sport is, is engaged in, there has to be some form of deception. So you think of volleyball, and, and you're, you've, got to, um, you've got to sort of put the ball up and make out that you're going to hit it in a certain place and, and sort of trick them and put it in somewhere where, where their weak spot is. Or if you're, if, you're going to, if you're running in the, in the football field and you sort of make a turn and you fake it and you go the other way, you have to deceive. There has to be a sense of deception to be able to get your goal. And so the principles employed in sport are the principles involved in war and are the principles that are used in the kingdom of darkness. Now, I'd like to read some quotes from the pen of inspiration, what the testimony of Jesus has to say. And I'm going to read a quote from Councils to Teachers and Parents. And it says, The world is full of excitement. Men act as though they had gone mad over low, cheap, unsatisfying things. How excited have I seen them over the result of a cricket match? I have seen the streets in Sydney densely crowded for blocks and on inquiring what is the occasion of excitement was told that some expert player of cricket had won the game. I felt disgusted. Why are not the chosen of God more enthusiastic? Do we show the enthusiasm that the world shows in sports, do we show that enthusiasm into the kingdom of God? Do we? Did Jesus show that enthusiasm in serving his father? You bet. He was, he was, he, that was his sole focus in his life to achieve the salvation of souls. He didn't lose sight of it. Just like the person who wants to win the race has their goal in view and they work at it until they accomplish it. Christ did the exact same and he was temperate in all things. For the sake of saving souls. How are we when it comes to soul saving? Now we might think, well, we've got to involve ourselves in sports to save people. Or people may say, well, as long as we have a prayer before we play, then that's okay. As if prayer sanctions idolatry. It doesn't. Prayer doesn't sanction idolatry. We can't pray over doing the wrong thing and then our prayer makes it right. It's nothing short than buying the indulgences that 
Tetzel was selling, um, Tetzel was selling uh, in the Dark Ages, where you could, you could do something and then the wrong was okay now. Why are not the chosen of God more enthusiastic? They are striving for an immortal crown, striving for a home where there will be no need of the light of the sun or moon or the, can or the lighted candle. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. They will have a life that measures with the life of God. But the candle of the wicked shall be put out in, out in ignominious darkness, darkness. And then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. It's a real shame, actually, that the world show more enthusiasm for nothing than Christians do for everything. I read another statement from councils to teachers and parents from page 351, paragraph 2. Uh, sorry, 350 rather, I start in there. And this is a s situation where Ellen White was in Avondale College and at their um, anniversary of the, of the erection of the first building, they decided to have some sports. And two of the sports that they played, one was tennis and the other one was cricket. And this is what Ellen White saw the night after, the, the, that night after the school were playing cricket and tennis, this is what she saw. In the night season, I, w I was a witness to the performance that was carried on on the school grounds. The students were engaged in the grotesque min mincery, mim mimicry, sorry, that was seen, acted out in the mind, sorry, acted out the mind of the enemy. What is sport? It's the acting out of the mind of the enemy. Does the, is there deception in the mind of Satan? Is that acted out on the play field? Is there rejoicing over other people's loss in the mind of the enemy? Is that acted out on the field? This is what she saw. This was tennis and cricket, by the way. It says... Uh, they acted out the mind of the enemy, some in a very unbecoming manner. A view of things was presented before me in which the students were playing games of tennis and cricket. Then I was given instruction regarding the character of these amusements. They were presented to me as a species of idolatry like the, idolous, uh, idolous nation of, of the idols of the nations. They were more than vis there were more than visible spectators on the ground. Satan and his angels were there, making impressions on human minds. Does the, for does the sport field grow pride? Can it also grow depression? Hmm. So Satan is on the ground and he's influencing people either in the pride of life through sport or if they utterly fail into the depression of sport. And so the winning team are joyous at their victory over the losing team and they're all happy because they have capitalised on the failures of others. And so the losers go into their lockers and they're all sad and they kick the floor and throw things around and are really annoyed and depressed. One shows depression, one shows pride. These bo both of them come from Satan. It says, angels of God who minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation were also present, not to approve, but to disapprove. They were ashamed that such an ex exhibition should be given by the professed children of God. The forces of the enemy gained a decided victory and God was dishonoured. So when we play sports and whether we win or lose, who's really winning? Satan's winning. And so in the schools, in Christian schools, schools that profess to be uh, educating the people for the future life, and they incorporate into the curriculum sport. 
Who's winning? Satan rubs his hands. Now people may say, look, it's good to play sport because it it helps with the all-rounded education of people. It helps people to be good sportsmanship. Tell me, the people who play the sports the most, who actually really go as... they they have uh, done it the most, are they better or worse than the people who don't do it? What's it like in... In, in, a, in a world league when someone loses? Are they good sportsmanship? Not at all. So the fact of playing sports, you would think that if it gives a, 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 the skill of good sportsmanship, you'd think the people who have done it the longest and who are the most professional at it should be the best at their sportsmanship of taking a loss or, or, or you know, not caring about a win. But not so. Do you know, I tell you, the best sportsmanship people are those who don't play sport. They don't get too upset because they don't lose or win. There's nothing, there's nothing there. And so, so the schools may think it's good for sportsmanship, but it's definitely not. And then some people may say, well, it's good to play sport because you get coordination. You know, I've seen people that are really good at sport, but they don't know how to hold a shovel. They wouldn't know how to use an axe to chop wood. So sports, while ever it can give you coordination on useless things in life, there is coordination in very practical things that if you want to spend your time, have a go plant a garden. Go and work outside. Or if you really want to learn to catch, play catch. That's not competitive if you just throw a ball to one another. That's okay. Where's the competition in that if you're just learning to catch something? I mean, that's a valuable skill. But you don't have to have competitive sports to learn the skill. And so the angels disapprove. They were ashamed and of the professed children of God and the forces of the enemy gained a victory and God was dishonored. And then it says, hearing, the, hearing a voice, this is still on the same subject of Ellen White at Avondale College in the 1800s, She writes, hearing a voice, I turned to see who spoke to me. Then, with dignity and solemnity, one said, Is this the celebration for the anniversary of the opening of the school? Is this the gratitude offering you present to God for the blessings He has given you? Your world could render as an acceptable an offering on this memorial occasion. The teachers are making the same mistake that has been made over and over again. They should learn wisdom from the experience of the past. The careless, godless world can offer an abundance of such offerings as these in in much more acceptable manner. Turning to the teachers, he said, you have made a mistake, the effects of which it will be hard to efface. The Lord God of Israel is not glorified in the school. If at this time the Lord should permit your life to end, many would be lost, eternally separated from God and the righteous. That's the words that were spoken to the teacher. The teacher can lose their eternal salvation by allowing the students to engage in activities that act out the sentiments of the devil and make it very hard to efface in later in life. To try and do something without competition. Because then when it comes even to the ministry and to the service of God, there's a continual comparing ourselves with ourselves. It would be so natural. If you're so used to being in a sports team, of comparing where your team is in regards to all the other teams on the the team ladder, then when you come into the ministry to compare, wow, how am I preaching compared to someone else preaching? Or how, how do I... Um, How do I conduct the ministry better than other people's ministry? How many people do we have compared to other people? And so this element can come right into the religious life and it is so hard to efface, to get rid of. What are we doing to our children? What are the children learning at school? And who's responsible but the teachers? Who was responsible at the bottom of Mount Sinai for that calf? Aaron was. Aaron was, and he had to repent really hard 
for his life to be spared. Deep repentance. Are we doing the same? Have we caused our children to engage in acting out the mind of Satan in competitive sports? If so, then we need to do what Aaron did and repent from that wrong. These things, and it continues, still on the topic of the Avondale School, these things are a repetition of the course of Aaron. When at the foot of Sinai, he allowed the first beginning, beginning of wrong by permitting a spirit of reveling and commonness to come into the camp of Israel. Moses was in the mount with God, and Aaron had been left in charge. He showed his weakness by not st- standing firmly against the oppositions of the people. He could have exercised his authority to hold the congregation back from wrongdoing. But just as in his home he failed with his children, so he showed the same defective administration in the management of Israel. His weakness as a general was seen in his desire to please the people. Now, it is very unpopular to tell people, hey, you shouldn't be playing sport. Do you know the reaction you'd get of people if you told them that? But you know, someone's got to say it. The ministers in God's church, those who profess to be God's ministers, have to say it. And if they don't say it, if they don't present the dangers of sport, competitive sports, if they want to please the congregation, then they're none other than dumb dumb dogs that don't bark. If there's a problem, this is the beginning. Where did it start? Where did this golden calf thing start from? It says that he, the first beginnings by permitting the spirit of reveling and commonness. Just to play a game. We eat, we drink, we rise up to play. And that was the beginning of the golden calf. And so it is when little children in primary school or very early ages are taught to play sports. That is the beginning of their experience with trophies. Which is the golden calf. And as parents... As teachers, as ministers, as people in responsible positions, the message must be heard clearly that if we involve ourselves in competitive sports, ourselves or our children, then we are not in the faith. And if we're not in the faith, we don't have Christ's mind with us, then we are reprobates. And so the the message was, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. I read from Councils to Teachers, um, page 456, paragraph 2. It says, I could, refer to the chap- I could refer to chapter after chapter of the Old Testament. Scriptures that contain great encouragement. These scriptures are a treasure house of precious pearls and all need them. How much time is spent by intelligent human beings in horse racing, cricket matches and, playing, and ball playing? But will indulge in these sports. Sorry, but will in, but will indulgence in these sports give men a desire to know the truth and righteousness? After watching some football match, do you feel like just praising God and studying your Bible flat out? Is that how you feel? Not at all. It will keep this uh, cricket matches. Um, spending time with horse racing, cricket matches and ball playing, it says this will keep, uh, will it keep God from their thoughts? Will it lead them to inquire, how is it with my soul? Will it lead to examination? All the powers of Satan are set in operation to hold the attention to frivolous amusements. And boy, he's done a good job, hasn't he? He holds the attention of thousands. Do you know what the most watched event on the planet is? Super Bowl. Is the most watched event. It's a sport. It was through sport that the Jewish church was ruined through the Greeks. And it is through sport that our own people are being ruined, are ruined and will be ruined by the same thing. 
He, Satan, is interposing his devices between God and the soul. He will manufacture diversions to keep men from thinking about God. The world, filled with sport and pleasure loving, is always thirsting for some new interest, but how little time and thought are given to the creator of the heavens and the earth. Can someone tell me, please, what is the first angel's message? Yes, fear God, give, give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come and worship Him who created the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. What detracts from the first angel's message? It says, the world is filled with sport, pleasure, pleasure loving, and is always thirsting for some new interest, but how little time and thought are given to the creator of heaven and earth. I want to ask you a question. Can you preach the three angels' messages while you endorse sports in your schools, in your universities, and in the churches in general? Can you do that? Not at all. So we just need to examine ourselves and come to the terms with the fact that if we are involved in sport, we are not preaching the three angels' messages. As much as we think we are, as much as we verbalize it, if sport's involved... We negate the fact that we are to worship God, the Creator, because Satan has employed sport and pleasure-loving to take the mind away from the Creator and from worshipping Him to the worshipping of the achievements of people. So this is a very serious message. Very serious message, very unpopular message, but that's okay. Someone's got to say it. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4, it tells us that, the, that in the last days, perilous times will come. They are here, my friends. They are here. Perilous times will come. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, These perilous times will come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters and proud. Does sport do that? Blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Now what do the children do if the parent says, look, you shouldn't play sport? <laughs> disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers. False accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded. Now notice this. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Are these heathen people that do this? Verse 5 says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such... Turn away. Do you have the mind of Christ? What is it saying? That there will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now it has become a habit in Advent circles that the Sabbath by young people isn't liked as much as Sunday. Do you know why? Because on Sabbath we have to go to church, we have to do the religious thing, we have to get up and put our clothes on and go and sit down and listen to a boring sermon as far as the kids can, that's what the kids think anyway, um, and, and do this religious thing. But then on Sunday, we can go and play our sports and enjoy the day. It's fun in the sun on Sunday. And generations of this lead people to unconsciously, underlyingly have more respect for Sunday than for Sabbath because they love pleasure more than they love God. And so it becomes a habit that the edges of the Sabbath aren't cared for because the clock is watched. Soon Sabbath will be going out. Then we can, we can engage in what we want to do. And so it's almost like waiting for the Sabbath to go. Such people are not Seventh-day Adventists. Such people are not Sabbath keepers. Because you just need to read Isaiah chapter 58 to see what a Sabbath keeper is. You know what it says there in Isaiah chapter 58? It says that if you do not turn your foot away from the Sabbath, from, from doing 
my pleasure on my holy day. Sorry, not doing thine own pleasure on my holy day, but calling the Sabbath a delight. Now, essentially, this text in Isaiah 58 and verse, um, verse 12 or 13, rather, 13, 12 or 13, I think it is, 12 and 13, yep. The, the principle is here that God is saying, look, I have a day. You're not allowed to do your own pleasure, but you have to be happy about it. Can you do that? Can you be happy when you're not doing your own pleasure? This will become evident by how you re relate to sports from this day on. Can you be happy if you never engage in sports ever again in your whole life? Would you be happy? Most people wouldn't be. They would feel like their legs been chopped off or some major privilege has been taken away from them. But that proves that it's idolatry. If you're upset with this, it's an idol in your heart. That's, that's the hard fact about it. Because if it wasn't an idol in your heart, you wouldn't mind. You'd say, okay, sure, there can be a little bit of a battle, but you will be happy to do God's will. That's if you have the mind of Christ. And what is our subject? Examine whether you're in the faith or not. Examine whether you're in the faith. And so this day, the Sabbath, is a sign of those who can not do their own pleasure and be happy about it. And if you cannot do your own pleasure and really rejoice in the Sabbath, then, my friends, you are on your way to being sealed with the seal of the living God. Because Isaiah chapter, uh, sorry, Psalms 16 verse 11 tells us that in the presence of the Lord there is fullness of joy and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Do you delight yourself in God? Do you find Him your joy? Are you a fan of God? If you're a fan of God, then you'll be most uh, enthusiastic about spending time with Him. You'll be, you'll be thrilled to be able to have time with God. Think about it. Who's your, who is your favourite fan on this earth? There may be some football player or some, some actor or some famous person. What if you got to spend time with them, just you and them? Would you be enthused about that? Well, what about God? Who is your fan? Are you a fanatic for God? <laughs> I hope so. Because if we're not fanatics for God, if we're not God's fans, then we will be fanatic in this world. We have to be a fan of something. And no man can serve two masters. If you're a fan of the world, you can't be a fan of God. And so just to conclude, I would like to um, mention that judgment starts at the house of God. Are you a person who is going to lift up your voice in regards to this issue? Or are you going to just sit there and go, yeah, okay, I, I, I believe it, but I'm not going to say anything to anyone. This is an issue that needs to be uh, proclaimed. We need to sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the land. Because if the righteous are scarcely be saved, where will the sinner and the ungodly person uh, uh, appear? This is a big issue. This is a tactic that Satan has employed that many people are not aware of. Yeah, they're aware of the Catholic Church. They're aware of other churches that are deceptive doctrines or, or other people that uh, twist the truth. But there's nothing more deceptive than the employment of sports and everything that goes with it. The music with the sports and the cheerleaders and the sensuality that goes with sports. It's all there. It's all in that package. Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 3. Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 3. And the glory of the Lord of Israel was gone up from the cherubim, cherub, where, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the forehead of the men that sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. Sm and 
and to the others in my hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite, let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity, slay utterly young, old and young, both maids and little children, and the women, but come not near any man upon whom the mark who is the mark, upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. Are you cry, sighing and crying for the abominations that are done in the land? You may ask, what are the abominations? Now you may recall, and if you don't recall, please read Revelation chapter 18. Because it tells us that Babylon has fallen, has fallen, has become a cage of every foul and unclean spirit, full of abominations. Full of abominations. And then it says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. If we want to cry and sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the land, we need to know what they are, so we can sigh and cry about them. We need a new heart to be able to do that. And if you read in Isaiah chapter 47, you will read about this Babylon, which is really taken... Uh, Revelation 18 is taken from Isaiah 47, largely. Isaiah 47. Isaiah 47. And, and we're just going to read verse 8. Isaiah 47. Actually, we'll read verse 7. It says, And thou sayest, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to thy heart, neither didst remember the latter end of it. Wherefore, hear now this, thou that are given to pleasures, thou that dwellest carelessly, that say in thy heart, I am, I am and none else beside me, I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. What's the mentality behind Babylon? Given to pleasure and careless. Are we careless to what God says in his testimonies? Do we just brush it off? Ah, oh, yeah, that was back then, not today. Are we careless? If we are careless and we are given to pleasure, be it known, my friends, that we are in Babylon. And the messages come out from among them. Be separate. For her, her sins have reached unto heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. Come out that you will be not partakers of her plagues. I'd like to conclude with one statement now. From Review and Herald, March 10, 1904. Are you in the faith? Think about it. How do you relate with this message? The humanity that bears fruit fill the soul with a sense of of the love of God. Sorry, the, sorry, I read this wrong. I'll start again. The humility that bears fruit, filling the soul with a sense of the love of God, will speak for the one who has cherished it. In the great day when men will be rewarded according to their works, uh, uh, according as their works have been, happy will be the one of whom it can then be said, the Spirit never stirred this man's soul in vain. He went forward and upward from strength to strength. Self was not woven into his life. Each message of correction and counsel he received as a blessing from God. How do you, how do you cope with correction? with reproof, with messages that, that upset the natural heart, that say that those who engage in sport are denying Christ and their Christian profession. Does that hurt? Well, if you are stirred by God's Spirit and it is not a stirring in vain, then you can really be happy because you can count that each message of correction and counsel can be received as a blessing from God. As many as I love or you can chasten, the Bible says. Thus the way was prepared for him to receive still greater blessing because God did not speak to him in vain. Will this message be in vain to you? Will God speak to you in vain today? Because if it won't be in vain, then God has more to share with you. 
more light to give to you if you will not take this in vain. Each step upward on the ladder of progress prepares, prepared him to climb still higher. From the top of the ladder, the bright beams of God's glory shone upon him. He, he, he did not think of resting, but sought constantly to obtain to the wisdom and righteousness of Christ. Ever he pressed toward the mark of the priors of his high calling in Christ. This experience, everyone who is saved must have. This experience being taking the, the rebukes and the sharpness from God's word, take it as a blessing. If, if this is your experience, then you can truly be happy. This experience, everyone who is saved must have. In the day of judgment, the course of the man who has retained the frailty and imperfection of humanity will not be vindicated. For him there will be no place in heaven. He could not enjoy the perfection of the saints in light. He has not sufficient faith in Christ to believe that he can keep him from sinning. Sorry, he who has, he who has not the sufficient faith in Christ to believe that he can keep him from sinning has not the faith that will give him an entrance into the kingdom of God. How is your faith? Do you believe Christ can keep you from sinning? That includes holding back from engaging in sport that you may have once loved. If you have had a real zeal for sport and you've been a real fan for sport, transfer that enthusiasm to Christ, please. If you transfer that enthusiasm into Christ, then you can run. Not as the only one that's going to win, but you'll receive the reward when Christ comes. I pray that we can examine ourselves to see whether in the faith that if we're not we can become faithful followers of Jesus by repentance and confession and appreciation of his love to show us these things. Amen.